like my worst nightmare. <laughs> Stay still. Could, could someone close the door back there? I closed it before. It opened itself. Thank you. Tommy. Okay. okay. Uh, this is HTTP. Uh, my name is Mark Nottingham. Uh, my co-chair, Tommy Policy. Uh, <laughs> don't tell him. <laughs> Okay, that was a different session, I guess. Tommy Pauly uh, uh, is elsewhere. He'll be back soon. Oh, of course you do. <laughs> uh, good start, good start. Okay, so uh, we have two sessions, one today and one tomorrow. Oh, let me open the right folder. There we go. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna start by discussing active drafts, so uh, compression dictionary transport, cookies, unprompted auth query, and retrofit. And then we have one other uh, 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 proposal uh, or presentation about QPAC stack table version TLS extension. And then tomorrow uh, we'll go back into active drafts with resumable uploads, template to connect TCP cache groups. And then we have a, a whole bunch of other topics tomorrow afternoon. Any agenda bashing? Okay. Uh, I don't have it on the screen, but hopefully by this part of the week, you're familiar with the IETF note well, which is the terms under which we all participate here regarding things like intellectual property and harassment policies. Uh, we do take this seriously. So uh, uh, please, if you're not familiar with it, look up IETF note well on your favorite internet search engine. Uh, and finally, uh, with the administrative work, uh, we need to find a scribe for this session. Would anyone volunteer to do so? And um, if you're looking at me right now, you're, you're at risk. So Mike, you, you looked away, you're very lucky. Anyone? Look at all those faces. Oh, thank you so much. So there's a link in the agenda and on the data tracker to a markdown environment if you could take notes there and especially capture decisions and uh, the major points of discussion that would be much appreciated. And if folks wanna help out there, please do. Excuse me. So first up, we have compression dictionary transport. Uh, and I believe this is Patrick, who's remote. Patrick, are you with us? Yes, yes I am. Well, let me get your slides up. Oh, no, that's not how you do that. OK. Um, do you want to request the presentation, or shall I, Patrick? Yeah, I, I mean, I requested. Do I need to do something else to request? I'd requested the slide share. Let's see. I think Brent preloaded slides. Let's yeah, try there that. We go. Great. Go ahead, Patrick. Alrighty. Um, so just a, a quick recap on what compression dictionary transport is. Um, the basic flow is any HTTP response can advertise that it is to be used as a dictionary for future requests uh, for compression specifically. And it provides a uh, wildcard based path matching uh, for the, the URLs that are same origin that it will apply for as a dictionary and a time to live for the dictionary to be viable for in the client. When the client at a future time makes a request with a URL for a path that matches a path that it has a spec for that has a dictionary, it will attach a available dictionary head request header with a SHA-256 hash of the dictionary contents, as well as uh, add the dictionary-based uh, encodings to the accept encoding. And uh, in this case, it's brought me in C standard. So, VR-D and ZSTD-D uh, for the dictionary variants of both of those. And if the origin or whatever the client is talking to uh, has a version of the response that is compressed with the dictionary or is able to compress the response with the requested dictionary, uh, the server will attach a hash 
the same hash of the, the dictionary that was used in the content dictionary response header, uh, which encoding it picked, uh, in this case, uh, Z standard with dictionary, and it will vary the response uh, based on the accept encoding and available dictionary headers uh, to make sure we don't get uh, invalid responses being sent to different clients uh, from caches. That's sort of where things are now in the draft as we've discussed it since uh, IETF 117. There have been a, a fair number of questions, issues and stuff in the, the spec uh, in the GitHub repository. And so there's a few changes that are in flight as PRs that we'd like to talk about. And so the first one is the, the request matching, the wildcard based path matching. Uh, there's been a request on the, the client side to replace the custom wildcard uh, implementation with Burl pattern, which is now a uh, what WG spec that at least on the browser side, they're moving towards anything that does URL pattern matching uh, to use URL pattern. Uh, so we have a consistent way to spec them and to split the match into a path component and a search slash query params uh, component, uh, which would be optional and default to uh, wildcard. So match all for the search. Um, what those keys are is certainly up for debate. I'm happy for shorter names with like just match being the path and match search or something like that for the optional one. Um, but splitting it uh, provides more deterministic construction of the URL pattern rather than trying to imply it from a given uh, string and try and decode which are special characters, which are not. And if it should extend into the search or not. Uh, the other one that we've added, or we'd like to add, uh, is match dest uh, to match on a destination, uh, fetch destination specifically, if the client supports it. So you could do something like have an HTML specific dictionary that applies to your whole site, and you could specify a match path that's like slash star with a destination equals document and not have that same dictionary be sent for all of the image requests and anything else that doesn't have a, a different dictionary that applies to it. Not that it would be any harm to send it if the, the origin didn't send it, uh, support it as a response for that type, but it just makes it easier to do things like site-wide HTML dictionaries. And then on the uh, variations, since we're varying based on the, diction, uh, the, di the requested dictionary and the accept encoding, uh, there's a chance for blowing things out uh, for caches pretty significantly, especially with the old default of a one year time to live on the dictionaries. If you've got something that's revving uh, versions of like a JS library multiple times a day, um, you're going to end up with cases where you'll have thousands of cache uh, partitions. So we're talking about uh, reducing the default TTL to be seven days since last set. Uh, so since last a request was made for a response that is to be used as a dictionary, not since it was last accessed to be used as a client dictionary. Uh, so you'll have it at worst case, a seven day window after you last use that uh, resource on your site uh, that it'll be available in the client. Uh, and to reduce very variations in the accept encoding, um, we're proposing sorting the the protocols, the, the, the codex, if you would, uh, so that they're consistent from client to client uh, for clients that support the same encodings. And for the dictionary versions of C standard and broadly to also require that they include support for the non-dictionary versions, just to reduce the number of permutations uh, of possible accept encoding strings won't completely uh, eliminate because you're going to have clients that support different encodings than other clients, but for clients that support the same encodings, hopefully it uh, results in similar accept encoding strings. And those are largely all of the issues that have come up and that are up for discussions. So time to bike shed, which is what we mostly wanted to do here and see how people felt about the changes, if there were other concerns.
Mike Bishop. Um, I see why you, I see why one might want to sort the accept encodings just to reduce, to reduce variation and just one, one less fingerprinting surface. I'm not clear why this draft would be the place for that. This draft is defining a new content encoding, not changing the accept encoding. Yeah, I mean, oh, the, the, the main reason we have it here is because this draft is including two new encodings, which is going to widely increase the number of variations. And so we were hoping, rather than require all clients to always sort the encodings, uh, any clients that support dictionaries at least will have to support the encodings. But I'm happy for it to not be part of this spec either. It's just since we're introducing new variations, I was hoping or I was thinking we should at least take some responsibility for reducing the pain that those variations cause. Yeah, it just, it seems like beyond the scope of the draft. Um, but similar token, I understand the desire to have the fallback and maybe that would be a good recommendation. I don't really see a reason it has to be normative. If you don't have the dictionary, you just can't do that one. I, I think there's an unregistered participant here, yes. Uh, Timothy. Timothy, are you remote? Does. I don't think I have anything I can do here to. Last chance, Timothy, if you press the button to. Okay, um, Timothy, I'm, I'm going to DQ you. If you if you can fix that, please uh, put yourself back in queue. If that's all right. Okay. Um, so I put myself in queue next. Um, regarding the sorting of the accept encoding, I'm concerned about that because it's leaning into caches treating accept encoding like a string when it's doing very processing, and that's the wrong approach here. You know, caches already have the ability to understand and, and evaluate and, and normalize the semantic based on the semantics matter. And they should be doing that. Um, I'm aware based on my testing that many don't, but I see that as an implementation problem. And I, I don't think we should be encouraging uh, uh, this behavior because it's frankly broken. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by Z standard D must include Z standard. If that's, a, if that's saying that you can emit Z standard when Z standard D is present. Uh, other, other way around. Okay. Um, I can repeat it. It's okay. Uh, Mike said the other way around. At least, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of that is if you support Z standard with a dictionary, you must also advertise support for Z standard without a dictionary. Correct. Yeah, we're trying to avoid introducing what, like, sixteen new possible permutations instead of just two. Right. But but someone who isn't aware of this, you know, an implementation that's not aware of this, is going to be less efficient as a result potentially. Although Z standard isn't widely deployed, so maybe that's okay. I'm a little more concerned about the broadly one, I suppose. Um, and and then reducing the default TTL to seven days. I know you have an open issue about the cache lifetime and time to cache lifetime. Maybe that's worth exploring. I mean, in general, uh, you, you said you know you're trying to avoid a cache having thousands of, of entries. Um, a properly implemented HTTP cache at least won't have that problem. Um, uh, it'll it'll you know do expiration. It'll it'll optimize based on its space constraints. So I, I, I this just seems a little preemptive uh, uh, to solve the implementation problems in caches. And so I'm, I'm a little concerned about doing it with protocol. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a TTL that's settable on the use as dictionary response header. And so it's really just about what is the default if it's not specified uh, and what's reasonable uh, for a dictionary where dictionaries are generally going to be uh, more useful for uh, re-engagements within a site. And so anything is arbitrarily fine. Um, a year was leaning heavily onto the uh, try and encourage as much dictionary use as possible. Uh, seven days is leaning more towards encourage dictionaries for uh, frequent 
users more so than uh, rare users. Okay. Um, could you go to your previous slide? Yeah. Um, so with request matching, I, I just had a couple of questions around that. Um, as I understand it, our pattern uh, uh, uses some characters to denote, you know, variables or whatever uh, that are valid characters in URIs. So what's the approach to being able to, to address all possible URIs if you're using your URL pattern here? So as far as I'm aware, other than the, the wildcard, so there are, I believe URL pattern has escaping built in for the, the characters that are uh, special for used when defining an URL pattern, uh, but are still representable. Okay. And, and my other, I and guess. We are specifying specifically that regex isn't supported, uh, and URL pattern has a way to specify that. Okay, good. That actually goes to my next question, which was, you know, if this needs to be, or, or could conceivably be deployed where an intermediary needs to be able to evaluate this, um, you know, there are some efficiency concerns with stuff like regex, uh, as well as potential attacks. So that, that sounds promising. Thanks. Uh, next up, it's Vlad. Hello. Uh, also mentioned on the mailing list that it would be nice maybe to have an option to not just get the hash of the dictionary, but the URL and ETAG. Just because, from my perspective as an engineer who would build it in Cloudflare, <laughs> that would uh, like to avoid the DNS to work, is we already have mechanisms fetch dictionary, so it fetch something based on URL and meta, and building machinery to find resources based on the hash is not a lot of extra work, and also reduces the scope. We could launch this possibly very big chain. Because, uh, like, obviously, if it's a pre shared dictionary, yes, you have to want to shop. It's a great way, but for something dynamic, with uh, less origin involvement, it would be helpful. Could have an option maybe to say, you know, if you want to use this dictionary, just Yeah, I was trying to think of exactly how we do that. And so the URLs don't necessarily map one-to-one -to, -one to a dictionary. And so we could have no, the clients Right, but when you when you supply when you supply the dictionary hash, if you supply the URL that the hash always already went with, um, that might help. But you still need to verify that your current version of what is at that URL matches the hash of what oh, is that's easy. That's easy. being requested. So I, I could see adding to the request the the URL on the uses dictionary response. I'm having trouble coming up with a way that would be easy to deploy for origins. Maybe something which is optional. No, no, origin store is different. Like if we're a cache for an origin, that's fine using the shop. Because then it's just very, I'm saying most of our users don't want to think about it. Right, and I'm, no, I'm just, Logo if. Something and you do it for them. On the use as dictionary response, um, is this where you'd want to have the hash of the dictionary as well, so you could know to store it yeah. with the hash? Well, no, that's not necessary. It's okay, a, so okay, but you still have to validate it, right? Right. Uh, yeah, but it could at least let you know. Do a quick look up to see if you've already got this hash in cache, and you do or do not have to do anything. <coughs> with this response and you can just pass it through or do you have to evaluate storing it or not? Yeah, that's also that's set. As long as we got a URL. It's, it's okay, so. I, I mean, even just the URL would allow me to run shot six. I probably wouldn't want to, but I think that would be first step. Vlad, are you concerned about having a separate index that you need to look up in? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so this that's is a- That you dynamically right. cool. This is a common uh, uh, consideration for, for high-scale intermediary developers. They, they very much are jealous of every byte that they have to store in index uh, because it's memory and it's overhead at that scale. Um, 
And you talk to folks like the traffic server implementers, for example, they have the same concerns. Okay. So I guess the, the question I have then is on the client advertising the dictionary that is available to be used for a given request, would adding a dictionary source URL here be sufficient to handle the cases that you're thinking of? A yes, but best if it also came with an e tag. So I like before I ran the Ulsha, I know it had matches and there's a good probability Ulsha would also match. So URL and e tag from yeah, the client to the just server. do like I can get my cache. Yeah. Match it's just a normal a request path for you. Yeah, it's a sub request. And I just okay. I mean, that, I that... You, like e tag. You don't yep. really count so there, there'd be two like dictionary source and dictionary e tag headers. But, but possibly it's just you know you can maybe specify in users dictionary which way you want it to be used, like with the shell or with the URL. I think we're always going to have to have the SHA in there. No, no, no. Uh, I mean, yeah. Just the SHA, so you don't have to send the extra information for whoever does need it, because URLs can be long. So you don't necessarily want to. I think I feel safer just adding the two headers and having clients send them. Those two feel like, yes, it could increase the size of requests. Um, I don't know that they'll be substantial enough to worry, but it feels like those two are easy for clients that are tracking the dictionaries already to have metadata about the dictionaries that they include with the requests uh, without much complexity. Yeah, I, I would think so. It's easier on the clients. And as long as they're relatively stable, header compression should do its thing. Excellent. Uh, next up, uh, David. I'm actually just relaying Timothy Terry Berry's message since ah, he couldn't get his microphone thank to you. work. Uh, so, um, I had a comment and a question. So first, I don't see a lot of details in the draft about how the dictionary is used by the different algorithms. Maybe this is obvious, but it might be helpful to at least have references. So that, that was his first point. Okay, I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, I can probably link to at least the shared broadly the the apis and clis for all of the at least for z standard and broadly have here specify a raw dictionary uh as an entry point where you pass it and it uses it as part of the compression or decompression context i don't know that I want to get into details about exactly how that's done but i can link to the broadly and z standard specs for that part Thanks. And his question was, uh, the motivation for that question is that one of the things I found very helpful for SDP compression with gzip for WebRTC was to truncate the original message as a cutoff shorter than the maximum window size. Making sure the start of the document is inside the window helps avoid resending some headers that only appear once, and leaving a little bit of extra room makes sending the same SDP with only minor changes work much better. Have you considered being able to specify a limit on the amount of document used for the dictionary? So there's what is set as a dictionary. When you've set a dictionary, the entire response is used as a dictionary. There's no sort of sub window. That said, for like the HTML case, um, they're largely going to be external dictionaries that are uh, custom built or even JSON and things like that. Um, the case where a full response is used as a dictionary for a future request is things like a WASM or a JavaScript or a CSS where you're versioning from one to the next and you really want to use the whole thing anyway. And so I, I guess the, the case of for something like uh, WRTC or whatever might be more akin to the the custom dictionary that's side loaded and you can put whatever you want in there. It's not using an existing native resource or reusing one. 
And yeah, I mean, as far as the size of the dictionaries go, um, right now, at least within Chrome, they're allowed to be up to 100 megabytes. Um, the what you choose to use is sort of up to you, but there aren't hard limits. We do have on the Bratly, there's some discussion on the Bratly encoding, I think, uh, separately about uh, window sizes and things like that, and how big should the default window size be. But I think that's outside the scope of the dictionary specific part of it. Thanks. And I'd say maybe after you're done with your presentation, he had a few follow ups, but they're now a little threaded. So if you wanted to break the chat after you're done, maybe. Yep. Mike. Um, just commenting on the SHA versus the uh, the path and the tag. I don't know that this is a blocker, but I just want to point out that one of the benefits of the SHA is that if you don't know what that SHA is, you don't know what it is, and it doesn't give you any information about the user's browsing history. It's on the same origin, probably doesn't matter, but you are disclosing a little bit more information there versus I've been through this specific path with an e-tag that you no longer have, so oh well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it exposes any more than the, the SHA exposes. We've already basically assumed that the, the SHA can be used as a user tracking token um, because you could generate a unique uh, dictionary uh, for every user and just tag them with it. Uh, and so we've already, on the browser side of things, uh, treated the, the cleanup and partitioning as if it was user identifiable. Austin. Hello, Austin Wright. Um, I'm curious if you considered using URI templates for matching URIs. Um, I've done some research on the area of matching URIs to URI templates, and it's possible, and you can do it um, in constant time with respect to the size of the number of templates that you're searching through. Um, it's When you do it that way, it's complicated to insert into, but um, suffice to say, you can do that. We haven't, I'll take a look, although um, there's definitely, I'd say strong pressure on the, uh, at least on the W3C side of things to move towards URL pattern for everything. Okay. Just, just to be super clear, is that from the W3C or the what working group? Um, I think a little bit of both. We've been getting it from, uh, the, the tag as well as the what working group. Patrick, did you have anything else or does anybody else have any other things to discuss about this bet? That was it for me. Okay. Uh, doubtless we will discuss this again, uh, but it sounds like things are moving along pretty smoothly. So thank you for that. Patrick. Uh, Next up, we have cookies. Uh, and again, a remote presentation from Stephen. Stephen, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. Yes. Can you, uh, do you want to request uh, the slides or shall we? Uh, yeah. Do you mind hosting them? And I'll just tell you yeah. when to switch through. That's absolutely fine. One second. Go ahead. All right. Great. Well, um, hello, everybody. This is a quick status update on RFC 6265 BIS. Uh, this one shouldn't take very long. There haven't been many changes since the last presentation in Yokohama. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, there's been one. Um, we added an advisory section to help implementers have a better idea of which part of the specs they should be interested in implementing. Uh, up until this point, the spec relied solely on user agent or servers, which wasn't always clear if you were writing a programming framework, for instance. So hopefully this will um, clear that up. Next slide, please. These are all of the open issues. Um, we've added a few editorial issues, but for the most part, it's stayed fairly constant. Um, the big one that's keeping the spec from moving along is that top one up there, number 2104, same site cookies and redirects. For anyone unfamiliar, 
Uh, the spec some time ago added a requirement that if you had a same site request that redirected to a cross site that then redirected back. Um, so basically the start and end points are same site, but you have a cross site redirect in the middle. Uh, that entire request should be considered cross site and should not send cookies. Um, both Chrome and Firefox found that enabling that behavior caused breakages. So we um, put it on pause as I've been looking for a targeted fix to that. Um, unfortunately, that's easier said than done. Uh, metrics haven't been particularly useful. Um, so Chrome is currently running an experiment which enables this behavior for a number of, a small number of users and encourages them to file a bug if they encounter any breakage. Um, <clears throat> I'm hopeful that we'll get some good information that way, but I'm going to consider this our final attempt at solving this issue um, for 6265 this. If we can't come up with a solution, I'm going to recommend that we remove this requirement from the spec for now uh, so that the spec can move along to working group last call and, and become a full spec. Uh, and then on the next version, we can take another look at this. Uh, let's see, next slide, please. And then in addition to potentially the same site redirect thing that I mentioned, we already have some additional work lined up. Um, partitioned cookies or chips uh, is waiting for, is waiting to be integrated as well as cookie spec layering, which is a project to detangle 6265 this from the other specs that it kind of clumsily re-implements at times. Uh, next slide, please. And that's all I have. Are there any questions? Any questions about the cookie spec? Okay. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thank you all. <clears throat> sure. You want to try? You've got it? Okay, you, you take it away. All right. Next up, we've got David Skenazi with the signature HTTP authentication scheme. Tip, take it away. No. Oh. Pink box, well, my friend. This one's wired. Box. I can't go too far. Yeah. All right. And the camera's pointing at you, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm David Skenazi, and here to talk about the signature. Auth scheme. So we used to call this unprompted authentication, but we've changed it a bunch. And I thought about renaming the draft in the data tracker, but who cares? That's a bunch of work for no reason. So, all right. And this is work with my co-authors, David Oliver and Jonathan Hoyland. Next slide. All right. So quick summary for folks who haven't weren't there in part prior sessions. The idea here is that the client authenticates to the server using asymmetric cryptography, and the server wants to hide the fact that it serves these authenticated resources. Uh, we adopted it a while back, rewrote the whole darn thing because that's what we do, but now like it's starting to kind of settle down. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the rough shape of how it works, um, you use a TLS key exporter to generate a nonce, you sign that nonce, and then you transmit it. And it has nice properties about what you need to send over. It doesn't leak the fact that the server has uh, this, uh, offers this authentication because you don't need to re request anything before the authentication and it also can't be replayed. Next slide, please. All right, so we had one big issue in there that we talked about uh, at uh, the last ITF, so in San Francisco, and that we then discussed on the issue about this kind of looks like exported authenticators, um, which is an extension to TLS. Should we just use that? So we thought about it, we looked into it, and kind of the conclusion was like from a mechanical cryptographical, cryptographic property perspective, it was possible, but it would require some tweaks to the spec over in the TLS working group, like nothing major, but enough that it would have to reopen that spec. And it, it would also make it a lot harder to implement. And for our use case, we have folks who want to adopt this from above the TLS library without like modifying the TLS library. And 
while it is not impossible to implement exported authenticators outside of a TLS library, it is much harder than the design we have here. So what we kind of landed on was to keep the current design and not switch to exported authenticators. Um, next slide, please. So just as a quick reminder, uh, one of the things we talked about is should we add the X or Y or Z to the exporter context? The answer is just add all the things. So these are all the things. And the idea being that that binds them into part of the cryptographic exchange so that they can't, you can't do you know, those kinds of attacks where you swap them out and you have confusion between uh, what the server thinks it's signing or not. Uh, so the signature algorithm is what we're using. Key ID is just an identifier. Um, the public key, so that's to, pre that's to prevent some uh, seems legit attacks. You just put the key in there. It kind of really double checks that um, the server thinks it's signing with the key that it actually is as opposed to a different one. You also put the origin in there and the realm if your uh, authentication is using realms, which is optional, that could be empty. Next slide, please. So uh, when you send the header, uh, you have these parameters. So the key ID, again, just an identifier into the database. We put the entire public key in there. In theory, that's not necessary, but from discussing with implementers, um, you'll have cases where if you implement this on your front end and the keys are in your <coughs> back end, it would be a lot more work. So we send the key in there. It's a few more bytes, it's a little bit wasteful, but since this header will always be the same on every request, header compression will kind of fix that. Uh, and then you put in the signature, as in like what you've signed, which algorithm you used to sign it with. And a verification is kind of another part of the exporter. Um, like if you want all the details of the cryptography, that was kind of, when we did the security analysis, it prevents a class of attack and it really makes sure that the sender actually has access to the TLS master secret. Next slide, please. Um, so speaking of security analysis, uh, Jonathan built the Tamarin model um, and that's kind of what found some of these issues, which is great, this stuff is useful. Um, we kind of, when the seems legit paper came out, Jonathan added more like characters to the model and typing things. I really know nothing about all this, but I think it's great. Um, oh, look, Jonathan's in the queue. Maybe he wants to say something about that. Um, so uh, there's now another paper on how you can extend the security model even more and you can consider even more attacks. So uh, I'm going to be doing that analysis imminently. But yeah, as far as we know, it all seems to work beautifully now. Can the security people stop making our lives harder by finding more attacks? God, it's so much hey, work. Hey. <laughs> awesome, but thanks, Tommy. <laughs> That's not how this works. Um, You're not very motivating, Tommy. All right, um, and so kind of one of the discussions we had, like comparing this to exported authenticators, so that uses um, Sigma, which is kind of the signed in Mac approach. That's core to TLS. Uh, this has a somewhat different construction, but from the analysis, it has like the same security bound. Um, and then as the last line says, if you know more about security than I do, please look into this and you find it interesting. And if you find something, please let us know because uh, more security be more good. Um, all right, next slide. Implementation. So we have a full implementation of an earlier draft, but that was kind of before we changed a bunch of things. So we're gonna have to spend a little bit of time updating it. And we're working on two more independent implementations of uh, what's left. Um, so hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have three implementations that can interoperate with each other. Uh, we're just getting hung up on dumb things like one implementation imp can only do HTTP3, another one can do it only HTTP2, and then they don't interoperate really well. Uh, next slide. So where do we go from here? Um, we wanna make sure that the spec is reasonable, so like we wanna actually implement it uh, before we ship it. Um, but we're, we've closed all the issues on this document. Uh, so what I would say is that Assuming that the implementation work doesn't find anything major that we need to make major changes, maybe we can get it to our new desk.
Yeah. Uh, and next slide, I think that's it. Um, yeah. You can add, go, go to the next one. That, that was yeah. it. No, Alessandro no. Gadini, oh. Cloudflare. Um, uh, just a clarification about the the exporter authenticators. I don't understand how that's more difficult than just doing TLS exporter in terms of TLS library implementation. Uh, so like if you can just clarify. Yeah, so the, the, the main reason is that you also need to extract from the TLS library which hash algorithm was used by the uh, HKDF inside TLS because uh, um, that's what you need for the uh, finished message, if my memory is correct, the, the Mac of Sigma. And not all TLS libraries give you an easy way to do that. Like, in, like on one hand, everything uses SHA-256 most of the time, but maybe not always. And so it's kind of, it feels like a foot gun when if we implement it with that, and then all of a sudden when it changes, things will break. Uh, okay, like, so I, I mean, this is more of a general comment about exporter authenticators. Like if, if the spec is not useful for some use case where it could be useful, then maybe it's actually worth doing the work to modify it, but then I don't really have a, you know, stake in the... Uh, Jonathan Hoyland, Cloudflare. There's another issue with exporter authenticators, which is, that the client cannot just send a certificate, as uh, cannot just send an exported authenticator. It has to be requested by the server. Um, we, we should fix all of the things with exported authenticators, but it is already RFC, so it's like, yeah. And so like it, it would be possible, but both in terms of standard work and in terms of implementation work, it'll be more complicated. And I don't think anyone wants to do that. If there are other folks who wanna Put, do more work on export authenticators separately. I think that that's a fine thing, but I don't think it's needed here. Tommy? Tommy Pauly, exported authenticator enthusiast or implementer at least. Um, I, personally, I think the decision you have sounds fine. If someone did fix those aspects of export authenticators, or at least the client being the generated part, is there a way to start using that with this? Or is like, well, what's the extensibility? Wow, oh, that was fun. <laughs> um, so in terms of ex like extensibility, the idea is like this header has a construction and we can build a different, or this, sorry, this authentication scheme has a construction and we can build a different one. It doesn't make sense to add a other layer of interaction in there. Yeah. And then just one other question kind of regarding the implementation set. It's glad to hear that there's implementation all experience already and plan to be more. C can you talk about like, if you can, like, is this just, you know, like do a little test between the things or like, is there any try to you know, deploy this or use this in some experimental setups, deployment experiments to see kind of like how it actually ends up working for the full thing in practice or is the plan to you know, just more do um, kind of basic and drop testing? Uh, more, more of a basic and drop in this case. I think the it's part of a wider plan to do other things, but the other things aren't ready. So like this won't be deployed kind of on its own. It's not a general purpose web thing, I don't see it, yeah. Mike? Um, so I wanted to respond a little bit to Tommy on the exported authenticators piece. Um, if you think about, let's say, because I probably will soon, someone were to write a draft about how to stick an exported authenticator into an authentication scheme. <clears throat> because of the problems we know that there are in the existing exported authenticator spec, you could also think of it as David is here addressing the case that we know exported authenticators currently can't do and handling it separately. And then we can write a draft to handle the things that already can do. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. All right. 
Thank you. Yeah, you got me really scared when you put 30 minutes on the agenda. Um. You said you might use it, so. <laughs> um, at some point, we might want to have a chat about the, the very generic nature of the name, but we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, I mean, if we want to bike shed that, I'm happy, and I'd rather do it sooner rather than later. Sure. Let's let's have a bike shed painting session, maybe in the hallway or something, because Salt. Yeah. it's not right. good to paint bike sheds in a working group. Okay. Next up, uh, we have just a couple of brief uh, 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 scheduled uh, drafts uh, that are active. First of all, the query method. Uh, this has been in our working group for quite some time now. And I know Julian uh, has, has not been able to make progress on it. Uh, I'm not sure if, if he's here. Uh, Julian, if you want to say anything, but but the last time I talked to him, uh, he, he assured me he is going to have time to, to work on this soon. We have a few issues left uh, to work through that are a little bit potentially difficult. Uh, regarding how this uh, interacts with the rest of HTTP, but uh, uh, there aren't many of them. Is Julian uh, out there? I don't see him in the queue. Oh, okay. Do you want to channel that? Thank you. Mike Bishop, channeling Julian. I have no news about query right now, but I did review the open issues, and I still think that a focused design team, telco, could speed the uh, could speed things up. So it sounds like we have a call for uh, design sure. team participants. So I, <clears throat> personally, I've given feedback on the issues and I'm willing to participate in a design team. I think that's, that's a good approach forward. Anyone else, just a show of hands. Uh, Mike, Mike Bishop, for your information, Julian. Anyone else interested? Okay, if, if, if that does some, sound like something you're interested in, talk to Julian or, or to myself or, or Tommy, of course, and uh, um, we, can, we can get you connected with the right people. But uh, let's see how that goes. And, and the next one is uh, uh, retrofit structured fields. Um, we've been focusing on uh, the structured fields BIS, uh, which is very much almost done. I think uh, we're going to have another last call yeah, next. So, yeah, just I, I was going to bring up in this section anyway. Um, so previously, we'd run a last call on that document. Um, and that's where we had brought up the fact that we want to include the uh, other string formats in there to handle non-ASCII strings. We had a consensus call on that. That work uh, was done and has been stabilized. So I think at this point, um, I will, right after this meeting, kick off another uh, very short working group last call for just like a week to confirm uh, that and then progress the document forward. Um, if there are any concerns about that, uh, please let me know, but otherwise I'll be kicking that off very shortly. Is that Julian? No, that was just random. Oh, it is. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the Q button. Um, we currently have, a, you have currently have a dependency on the, on Tim Bray's Unicode characters internet draft. And I'm not sure how that will be progressing. So we'll need to make a decision whether we can rely on that if we want to finish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's an informational reference though. Yeah. So it's, it's worst case if it really looks like it's going downhill by the time we get to the RFC editor, I think we probably could take that out in the last stages of process. And I'm seeing an area director nodding and thumbs upping, which is always good to see. Um, yeah, I, I noticed that too, Julian. Um, and, and regarding retrofit, um, I think I, I characterized that, that, that we have an approach in the draft. We've had a fair amount of discussion about it and it, it's relatively stable. Uh, we talked about it a bit last time. And I think we wanted to take a bit of a pause with that and, and have a think about it to make, because it is quite an abstract draft, it, it doesn't have you know, any hard interoperability requirements and, and it has some interesting interactions with fallback behaviors, for example. Uh, we wanted to have a bit more of a think about it and, and maybe think about how it could be used in different cases, even if they don't make their ways into the draft uh, to make sure that we were confident in, in taking that work forward. 
So I think once SF this is is uh, finalized, then we'll revisit it, do some of that work, and, and see where we are. So we'll probably talk about it again in, in Brisbane. I'd say so that that's my feeling about it at least. And I see nodding from from Tommy, which is good. Any any thoughts, questions, comments on SF this or on uh, retrofit? Okay. Uh, we're doing really well on time, which is interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if I could shave just one thing off of Friday's agenda just to give us that little bit more time then, which is uh, a, probably, again, a very brief discussion of uh, a new spec we, we've just adopted, which is the cash groups spec. Any objection to moving that to right now? Um, so, and I see a thumbs up, which is always great. Uh, so this is a new spec that we uh, just did a call for adoption for. We discussed it last time. I'm editing, and uh, to refresh people's minds, this is a, a new cash control mechanism to group together responses so that you can do things like invalidate them together. Uh, this is pretty widely implemented in content delivery networks, for example, in reverse proxies. And so this is kind of paving a cow path to be able to do that in a standard fashion. And my interest is in doing so in a way that is truly interoperable. So even the fine differences of how many, you know, what's, what's the minimum number of, of groups that you support, for example, is you know, talk, recommended in the spec. Um, it's very new. If, if you would like to take a look at it and contribute, please do so. I don't think there's anything to discuss today, but if anybody has any thoughts, now's the time. No? Okay, that saves us 10 minutes on Friday, which is exciting. Uh, and I think that takes us to our last item today, which is the QPAC static table version TLS extension. And Rory is remote. Rory, great, you're with us. I am. Can you hear me? Do you want to drive the slides or would you like us to? Uh, if you could, that would be fantastic. Sure, one sec. Oh, Tommy's on it. Go ahead, Rory, just as soon as, yep, there they are. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really boring name. Um, first of all, I should note that um, Mike Bishop and Anne Frendel at least are in the audience. So this is not intended to be a diss on QPAC, which they, they came up with. Um, so if you've read the thing, QPAC is the, uh, next slide. Um, so what is, this is briefly, what is the QPAC static table and, and why it's, there are issues with it? Um, so next slide, answer this quick. So QPAC is what H3 uses for compression of headers and trailers, very simple. Um, and rather like um, HPAC, it has a static and a dynamic table. So rather than send through, um, you know, full headers themselves, even though they're compressed in binary format, you can simply send through a, <clears throat> Uh, a, a very simple little byte for each of them. Each of them has an index in the static table. And for headers that are not common, you can pass in the dynamic table. So we have in QPAC a static table. It is has 99 entries, very simple. Um, and every H3 client and server right now supports QPAC. It actually has encoded in it what that table is. Um, so we don't need any kind of versioning for this table right now. But um, QPAC, the, the data that was used to define this table, is already five years old. Um, since it was created, there are a bunch of new headers that are now pretty common. Things like all the sex CH, missions policy, things like the X powered by. There are a bunch of headers that are commonly passed back and forth now between client and server. And because they are not part of the predefined static table, they always get passed in the dynamic table, which means they always get passed as strings, compressed strings, but still strings. So this proposal is for two things. One is to say, and actually next slide. Um, so we have this static table, it's old. It includes some invalid values, 
And it doesn't mean for upgrades. It's just the appendix to the original QPAC spec that Mike and Al and um, Buck put together. So my concern is, okay, it may already be out of date. There may already be headers that are being passed back and forth that are not, that are very common, that are not in the static table, therefore having to pass them dynamically, effectively as strings taking up bytes on the wire. So this proposal says two things. One of them is to define the QPAC static table in probably an IANA registry um, and enable new headers to get added to that QPAC static table such that clients and servers can then reference the latest version um, and the number of entries that are in that QPAC static table. And therefore, as many as possible of the headers that are passed back and forth can be passed as simply references into this shared static table. And secondly, that there will be a negotiation scheme, which is the TLS extension bit, that happens before the HTTP requests, um, where both the client and the server negotiate on entries that are in the um, that are in the static table. So, in short, in the current initial table would be defined in a registry as new commonly passed headers get discovered. New um, you know, new headers that are being passed frequently will get added to that QPAC static table. Um, and then clients and servers can say, yes, I support a static table with 120 entries and the services I support it with 150 entries and they agree on 120 entries. Um, it, this is really all about future proofing. It's about saying that we need to have a standard mechanism for doing this. Um, next slide. Um, so the future proofing is, is important. We need a standard way of being able to um, keep uh, headers, every client, every server on the same, in the same place in terms of headers. And the interoperability chaos is something that I'm concerned about, um, where potentially different vendors may decide to say, okay, well, you know, we have our own particular internet connected device. Um, let us say, you know, an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home or whatever, and they start adding their own static headers. This could be problematic if then it then becomes impossible for testing tools to be able to, to be defined, which can use um, both, which can, which can rely on a standard set of headers in there. So the spec basically says, yes, let us define um, an IANA registry or in future potentially multiple IANA registries to store all these headers and define this entries in the static table. And then the TLS extension to, um, to enable the client and server at runtime to negotiate which version of that static table, how many entries they agree with. Um, originally, if the last slide is going to... So the things that brought up when I brought up in the working group, should this even be a TLS extension? I mean, this is an HTTP internet draft, so we're doing some boundary crossing with HTTP and TLS. That is a valid concern. Um, I'm not sure how else it could be done. Um, I was looking at Alps and Alpen, and I see that Dave Benjamin thinks that this should be Alpen. Um, it could be, I'm just not clear on how much either Alps or Alpen is actually being used now, whether it is a valid um, standard which is being used. If it is, brilliant, this should maybe be thrown in there. Um, alternatively, could this run actually in HTTP, could there be, you know, in the first request, a header which says from client to server, this is what I support and server responding. That seems a little hacky because we're sending headers, discussing headers. Um, and of course, as has been pointed out to me, why am I worrying so much about interoperability and staleness? This isn't a big deal. 
you know, things will get sorted out, but I would like them to be sorted out sooner rather than later. That's it. That is my, uh, that's my proposal. Uh, thank you, Morris. I see the queues filling up. David? Oh, yes. David Skenazi. Thanks for bringing this work, Rory. Uh, so my first question is, um, well, the meta question is like, how much will this help? And I guess, so have you measured some data on like looking at headers that go through your servers? And if you picked, you know, one new dictionary, how, how, like what kind of percentage gain will we get for like real traffic compared to what we get with the today's dictionary? Do you know? Very good question. Um, the quick answer is I don't know. I'm trying to do some testing now. What I do know from looking, and this is purely looking at the HTTP web archive data, is that the current QPAC static table defined in the QPAC spec is there are a lot of headers now by a lot. I mean, I think there are nine or 10, which are significantly more frequently found than the least frequently found entry in that table. Um, how much this actually matters, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a case of, does it matter that much that we are passing things in a dynamic table as strings rather than just abstracted um, references into a, a shared table? I don't know the answer. Um, I'm trying to test it now. Thanks. So I don't work on browsers anymore, but as someone who did, I would want to see some of those numbers before saying, okay, then this is cool. We should like work with you and we should implement it. Um, Absolutely. And then on the last bit, my personal take is um, ALPS was really designed for things exactly like this. I really well, personally think we should have designed HTTP three that way, but that sh ship has sailed. Uh, and luckily, Martin Thompson's too busy right now with Nomcom, so maybe we can ship ALPS today, and that way it'll be fine. Uh, uh, look, I would love nothing more than for ALPS to get, to get shipped. Um, last thing, last thing I checked, um, and I forget, oh, it was uh, it was Victor Vasiliev who who came up with ALPS, and his understanding was that, and I'm not sure if he's there is there was some implementation, but it just kind of got lost. Um, that draft has now expired. I'm not even sure of the current status of ALPS, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, well, if I can answer that. The, so it was a proposal from Victor to solve this and other problems. Uh, some people, Martin, that's why I was making that joke, um, didn't like it, and that kind of put it on pause and then everyone being busy with other things. So it doesn't have any kind of official standing. I think it's just an individual draft. Um, but my put would be that this is a great argument to revive that work. Um, but that's a conversation for probably another time. Uh, Mike Bishop. I just wanted to offer to jump the queue because I have some done some recent profiling slash data that if, no, if I didn't, if that's okay with other folks. Mike, is that okay? Okay. And Alice, Go ahead, Alice. Um, Hey, Alan Frendel. So thank you for bringing this. I, I think it's interesting to talk about. So just in terms of data, so I, I went and did some optimization. It was really in, in our, so I work for Meta uh, in around compression uh, earlier this year. And so I spent a lot of time analyzing what headers are sent across our CDN insider data center, which involves a bunch of stuff that's not standard anywhere. People make up headers all the time. Um, and also tuning our dynamic table strategy. So, um, so that's I have that recent experience. I didn't come prepared necessarily with it with data to present, but I I, I will make the offer to go back and, and look at it with the caveat that it's not general internet data, right? It's it's very specific to what's mostly being sent by our apps and browsers are very rare in our world. Um, so that's one thing I have. Uh, I also know we've been we experimented with rolling out a different. Uh, HTTP client stack across our apps earlier this year, or across Instagram, I think, and uh, that had different compression strategies and you, with respect to the dynamic table. And 
until we corrected its strategies to match the ones we already had in place, we saw big regressions. So I just wanna, we've been talking a lot about static table and the performance benefits that it offers. But I just wanna point out that the dynamic table can be very powerful. And some of the things that you've addressed with the static table are, were sort of meant to be papered over by the dynamic table. As in, you only send the string once, it gets added to the dynamic table. And if you're being smart about how you manage your dynamic table, then you can make sure that never falls out by duplicating it and uh, et cetera. Um, so that, that's another possibility. I feel like there's something else I wanted to add, but I'll let the other folks go unless anybody has any questions about that bit. But I, I will offer to, to try to make, I mean, and the other thing is that I did all this analysis in a bespoke way and it took a bunch of time and I didn't take the time to automate it and whatever we do, if we decide to continuously update the table, we should automate it so that we don't have to do it all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Mike. Oh, Mike Bishop. Um, as, as I've said before, I'm interested in being able to do this. We had an issue open in H3 to be able to adjust the static table that was in use. And we decided to table that at the time because if we needed it down the road, we could build an extension for it. And here's the extension. Um, I do, I'm less enthusiastic about the plan to just tag things onto the end of the static table because the longer your index gets, the less useful it is because the more bytes it takes to refer to that. Um, I think the ability to choose a different static table which this would enable and then have a collection that you can somehow choose from is probably more, more appealing. Um, that said, also being able to trim it and say, you know, I know about the first 92 entries, the first 150 entries going the other way is also interesting because if you remember, we had some IOT discussions around H2 and H3 and there were concerns about having to statically compile, the entire table into your binary. And you know, if, if somebody yeah. wanted to come along and say, I don't support a static table, just send everything literal, or I only support the first 16 because they're really useful. Um, th this would allow um, that as well, potentially. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I didn't really mention it there. The, there would be a concept of being able to say, for instance, if you were a particular client, which you know only ever talks to a particular server or in Alan's case, some internal stuff, they could each specify their own um, static table, which might only have 20 entries in it mm -hmm. because they know those are the only headers that we only ever pass. And then they'll, the couple of specific ones will go on the dynamic table. Um, and that worked very well for IoT stuff where you have a tiny compiled binary and you don't want to be having a bunch of extra headers that are never going to be passed in there. Right. So I think. For me, the takeaway here is the specific details here, there is a lot of wiggle room on exactly how we spell this. Maybe reviving Alps versus having a dedicated TLS extension is gonna be more palatable. I certainly think it's cleaner, but yeah. Alps has its own issues. There, uh, how we spell the negotiation, all of that has wiggle room. But I support the overall point of the static table should not be a, we wrote it once and now it's set in stone and you must live with it forever. Because I wrote it and there was a lot of black magic of, well, let's move this entry up here to get past this cut line. We can do better, I'm sure. Thank you. And I certainly, like I said, I didn't want to diss you or, or, or Alan or, or Buckham. <laughs> the original design. Rory, just so you know, we have a pretty long queue. So we need yeah. to Ahead, Alessandro Gadini, Cloudflare. Um, I also agree, like, this seems like useful work. Uh, it, it always seemed like a bit weird that we would define, you know, a single static table once and then that would apply for years and years and years. Um, I mean, it's not just new headers, but there's existing stuff like expect CT that is probably not that useful anymore and it should probably not be in the static table. Um, um, so, I mean, as, as Mike said, there, there's a lot that needs to be figured out. I 
don't particularly understand the whole negotiation process that is described in the in the in the draft um th the way i would think it mentally is you know someone comes makes a draft defines a whole static table and then you know that static table v2 and that goes into uh, a registry somewhere and then you would simply have to negotiate that specific version rather than um you know i have to modify the existing registry or or there's a, a length parameter in the TLS extension. So, so that all seemed a bit too complicated. I don't know. Do you know of any like specific use case that that would um, be required for? The use case there, I mean, in terms of length, the length issue was that if, if both the client and the server are using the same table, but one of them, the client only supports 99 entries and the server supports 150 entries, we would need to make sure that they only both negotiate the same, that they're only going to reference 99. Otherwise, you could have a problem with the server sending back, oh, static table entry 120, and the client doesn't know what that is. It has no idea. Right, but wouldn't uh, the length of the static table be part of like what the version of the static table is, right? Well, and so this is where we're coming up with the concept of, of a version which could potentially be a reordered um, copy of the table. So you'd have version one, which might have multiple lengths and entries added to it. And then version two might say, well, now a header that had been added to a previous version as entry 100 is actually the second most common header that we ever find. So let's stick that at the beginning of a new version of the table um, because it will use fewer bytes. Um, oh, OK, so like we, we can probably discuss this later. But my, my yeah. point is, if you define a version of a static table, you define the table in its entirety rather than reference. Correct. Yeah. So version refers to ordering, and length refers to number of entries, yeah. Hello, Lucas Pardew, Cloudflare. Um, we've got loads of time left on the agenda, right? So um, I could talk about, uh, in a previous life, I was working on uh, multicast HTTP. And so one of the, the real difficulties we had there was that a lot of the HTTP stuff worked. And this was like H3 before it was called H3. But one of the real difficulties with the dynamic QPAC stuff is that you could never really join a session that had already been started because you, you didn't have the every instruction that was driving the QPAC dynamic table into the state that it needed to be to be able to join. And so one of the things I always wanted to be able to do was have um, a pluggable static table, so to speak, either, you, you can always just work around and send string literals, but it's super attractive to the, the idea that we could define domain specific um, tables like this, because it could really help in kinds of, of use cases. Obviously, this isn't an adopted work or, or anything like that. But I can I could see creating a mechanism to allow pluggable stack tables, whatever you want to call it, could enable a load of interesting things. And that's what I'm more interested in than just an append-only operation, um, especially because of the concerns that Mike has already expressed. So I won't go into them. But the one I wanted to pick up on is I think you know th th there's a land grab. It's, it's better to be early than later. I can see the whole process of trying to keep up the table up to date, getting very political and and taking forever and chewing up cycles somewhere. I, I don't know, even know where you would do that. Well, the, one of the early suggestions was the IANA designated expert would have this job to do each year. And I think that that is terrible for so many reasons. We couldn't do it. It would probably need to be part of the working group and or it just doesn't work in my mind. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, Julia mentioned in the chat that, you know, why not H2? I think we should seriously consider that the mechanisms might be different, but that there's no reason to make these things wire specific because it's HTTP, right? It, it needs to work for HP4 or whatever we come up with next. <coughs> um, so yeah, that's all I've got to say. Thank, but I want to thank Rory for bringing this conversation to the list and um, kind of bring some ideas to the table that we could pick holes in. Cheers. Thanks, Lucas Kazuho. 
Uh, Kazu Hokai uh, first echo what my grand Lucas said. I think we are at a very good start now. And regarding how we convey the negotiation signal, I'm not sure if we need to use the ATOS extension or ALPS. Uh, it can, we can just use the settings frame because it's, I mean, when TOS is doing one RTD, the settings can be sent in 0 0.5 RTD. And then when the client tries to send the first request, then it will know what the server is capable of doing. And in case of uh, zero RTD, we know how to negotiate. We've already done that in Quick or HTTP3 by using, uh, re remembering the information of the previous session. So we can just follow that pattern and do it. And uh, I'll push myself to the back of the queue, Dragana. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Dragon Yanis, Microsoft. Um, so I'm probably going to repeat a couple of stuff that you said. Uh, I would like to see the performance data before we do anything. That is one. Um, I would really like to ask, avoid TLS extensions if we don't need to. And Kazuko actually said what they wanted to mention. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Mike. Thanks. Hi, Michael Tumim, Invisible College. Um, I just want to kind of go along with what Lucas is saying. And I'm just noticing that if we're at the point where the static table has multiple versions, then maybe that is a dy dynamic table now. And so it might be time to rethink the model a little bit. Uh, maybe this is more of an initial table, or maybe we want to rethink what dynamic means and how you initialize. Thank you. Dragana, you've re-entered the queue, is that? Oh, and, oh sorry, and Vlad. Uh, Vlad Krasnov, Cloudflare. So first of all, yeah, I think it's a good idea to have this extension, given the data shows good uh, compression. But regarding the version, as I understand, you send one version number and you pick the lower between the version on the server and the client, which is like TLS. However, once we get like to 50 tables, you have to have them all on the client, which kind of doesn't make sense. Like for a server, it's not a problem, probably a big server having all those tables, but maybe it should be a list of supported. Yeah, I mean, frankly, the, if it were a TLS extension or Alps or something in the settings frame, yeah, I mean, you might, I would ideally want to have the same thing to do with Cypher Suites and TLS extension. The client just sends through, these are the ones that I support, and the server responds with whichever one it supports. And as long as they both at a minimum support the current basic version, they can negotiate to that, but perhaps they can negotiate to a separate thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's one of the reasons we're discussing this here, because you're right, we can't really have a client with 50 different version of the table for all the ones that it, it supports. OK. Uh, David Benjamin. Uh, David Benjamin. Um, so on half RTT data, we did consider that when we were designing Alps way back. Well, that's a lot of feedback. Um, and uh, I wrote a draft, I, I'll, I can, I'll, I'll send a link to it in the chat, but it's like comparing Alps and half RTT data. It, half RTT data does not quite work when you have a strong ordering between the server's information and the first request, because you need the client to wait for the settings frame, but there's no guarantee that the server will actually send the settings frame at half RTT. So you need to like change the expectations slightly, either by bumping the version, or bumping the like ALPN version, or by just introducing a new kind of animal. And due to the state machine issues anyway, we were like, it's just to make a new kind of animal. So that, like, just using half RTD is not quite as simple as it sounds. Thanks, David. Uh, Yaroslav. Uh, there was a good point raised about domain-specific header sets, such as IoT devices that might have small, very specific set of headers in, instead of generic HTTP. So maybe instead of 
numeric version notations, it would make more sense to support alphanumeric strings mm -hmm. where people could define their own domain specific tables rather than some arbitrary numbers. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, um, and I inserted myself at, at the end, uh, just speaking without any hats on. Uh, I'm not gonna bother getting up to go to the mic uh, because I'm old. Um, I'm gonna s sound a slightly different note here. I remember when we did the static table in H2 and then as part of H3, it is a byte shedding process. Um, there's a lot of opinions about what should go on the table and what should not. Uh, for example, uh, Rory, you mentioned X powered by, and yes, that is seen a lot on the internet, but the question is, do we want to encourage its use by putting it in the standard and making it more efficient? And you have to have that discussion. And so I, I, it's not quite as simple. I think you need to think about what's the governance on selecting these things and how often do you want to do it? Um, is this something that, that you know, is done very dynamically or is it something that we do every five years or, or something in between? Because that changes the nature of the decisions you make. Um, at one end, yeah, you need to have it very dynamically negotiated. At the other end, maybe it's new ALPN token and maybe that's okay. Uh, which we've talked about before and all the different discussions there. If you do need ALPS, then that's, uh, again, another hurdle to get over because uh, uh, so far it hasn't had uh, uh, enough support and it's had enough detractors where it hasn't gotten over the hurdle. Um, so, so it comes back to, I think, for me, the first comment, which was how much gain do we get from this? And my recollection of the first process was the static table is really just to get you through those first few flights. After that, you're in the dynamic table. And, and so the benefits from it could be quite limited, especially when you start doing trade-offs like making your references larger, as Mike mentioned. So I think more than anything, we need data here before we can move forward. Does that make sense? That, that's my take on it. Uh, Alessandro. Alessandro Ghedini, Cloudflare. Just a comment on the static versus dynamic table. Um, uh, in particularly for QPAC, there is a lot of complexity that goes into actually implementing the dynamic table and implementing it in a way that is actually performant and doesn't run into like blocking and, and stalling. Um, so it is a fairly, I, I, I'm not saying common option, but like some implementation do not actually implement dynamic table. Um, so actually improving the static table, I think is, is if we can actually prove that, you know, there is benefits, then it seems like worth the, the work. As, as almost a dynamic table replacement, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, Lucas Pardee, Clyde Blair. Um, Mark's comment just then reminded me of like some discussion I watched from an arm's length about um, how good it would be if we just embedded certain JavaScript libraries into browsers, for instance. <laughs> That's, um, yeah. So, so Alex Russell wrote a, a blog post about this like last year. I'll post the link in the chat just in case. Um, uh, kind of viewing at how this sounds great, but the, the ramifications of that in terms of entrenching behaviors and stuff that maybe we don't want. Um, and like we really need to think hard about that. Cheers. Alan from Dell. I just wanted to quickly respond to the, like we don't implement the dynamic table. Uh, yeah, I know it's complicated. Uh, every time I tried to make it not complicated, somebody made me make it complicated. So sorry uh, that it's like that. And I think if your use case is like, well, I, I, I wish these 10 headers were in the static table. I think you can write a very simple dynamic table implementation that just pops those in in your first flight and then you're off to the races. So you might be able to get what you're looking for for a lot less work. And, and since you mentioned the word complicated, that was my other concern here was just you know, how complicated is this going to get? Uh, but it sounds like we, we, there's definitely interest in this topic. You know, it's putting my chair hat back on. It sounds like there's definitely interest in exploring this space and seeing what else we can do here. Uh, would you agree, Tommy? Yeah, I definitely agreed on that. Um, and I heard several people talk about data and I see in the chat, you know, where's the data coming from, but it seems like some more discussion about actually collecting the data on this and what's working well and what's not should be the basis of informing our decisions going forward because that's what's going to be compelling for all of us. And, and, and to that point, um, 
data from the viewpoint of one server side vendor is interesting, but also I think data from client vendors especially would be quite interesting because they're more diverse. Ellen. Just a suggestion as a follow up, maybe you can put out a call on, I don't know if a call on the list is really gonna do anything more than just saying it here, but just saying like, because like, for example, like I had a bunch of compression data sitting around a few months ago as I was going through that process, but I didn't need to like write it up and share it. But if you just said like, hey, we're gonna, I don't know, another HTTP workshop or an interim or something and say like, if people wanna bring their compression data and just compare, talk about strategies, compression strategies, the, I don't know, four people in the world who think about this um, can get together. I don't know, just an idea. Yeah, yeah, not to cross the streams, but a venue like the workshop would be a nice place to talk about this. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rory. It sounds like the discussion is going to continue. Um, any anything else on that topic from anyone? Okay. We can. I think. Oh, Mike, go ahead. If it turns out that we do wanted want to do this and we want to do it through Alps, would that be a formal request of TLS, or would that just be us going to TLS and shaking things, or what? I, I, my recollection is is that there were some concerns about Alps in terms of, of not just feasibility, but you know what effects it would have on the ecosystem. So I would, those discussions I would have to be had. I don't think we can guarantee anything. Uh, but I, I personally, I'd, I'd want to see us discuss like a lot more about this first before we get to that point because we need to know what properties we need from the negotiation system before we can say we need that one. I, additionally, I think we have sufficient overlap between TLS and HTTP, at least at the beginning, to have that in the conversation, do some initial evaluation, but more importantly, figure out what do we want as the properties from any solution. Um, I, I, I don't see a world in which you're just like, we need this from your working group. Like, yeah. We have a much more collaborative approach across these working groups. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I think we can give you now three minutes back uh, and we'll see you again tomorrow. That was interesting. What they should give you when you leave the ID is the big paintbrush. <laughs> At one point, I think, yeah, when Joe Hildebrand left, they, uh, uh, we, you know, they gave him a little gift, you know. I found online a little miniature bike chair model. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Ye